I think most of us do the first date completely wrong. We set ourselves up to fail. And the reason why is because... It's so true. <laughs> I can't believe how true this is. <laughs> Paul Brunson, the world's most influential matchmaker. He's got a hit show on Oprah's network. Right at first sight, you pay. This you may never have heard before. My expertise is relationship science. And the beauty of science is that if you can change the formula, you change the results. So if you are someone who is in a relationship and you're unsure how to communicate, there's certain things that you could change. Tell me what those are. It seems so simple but it literally changed my marriage. So we're terrible when it comes to making any type of rational decision around our love life. And if you can't have emotional intimacy, you just simply can't have a relationship. You have acquaintances, you have situationships, but you don't have relationships. Let's talk about sex. Can you be physically attracted to somebody, but then not have sexual attraction? There are different languages, sexual languages. You have to understand how your partner, the language that they speak sex in. Men, we need to know this. 70 to 80% of women need Before this episode begins, I just wanna say a huge thank you to all of our new subscribers. 74% of you that watch this channel didn't subscribe before. And we're now down to about 71%. So that helps us in a number of ways that are quite hard to explain, but simply the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests get. So if you haven't yet subscribed to The Diary of a CEO, if I could have any favors from you, if you've ever watched this show and enjoyed it, it's just to, to please hit the subscribe button. Without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett, and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. Give me your context. What do I need to know about you from your earliest years, from those first sort of 15, 16 years of your life that would give me the context I need to understand the person you are today? So I was born in Jamaica, Queens, oh, wow. you know, and our claim to fame is, uh, is, is Curtis Jackson, 50 Cent right? Uh, being shot nine times in our neighborhood. That's our claim to fame. But everyone was like, okay, I get it. That's, that's where it was. Um, so grew up there. It was a heavy Caribbean, Jamaican, uh, first and second generation neighborhood. But my father was, who was the first in his family to go to college. He focused in uh, computer science. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so he, you know, hustled and my mother hustled and was they, we were able to buy a home in Long Island. And that was the, like, you've made it. You've moved out the city and you've moved to, to Long Island. We were the first black family to live in this neighborhood. The first, I'm, I'm talking about a hundred homes. Mm -hmm. We were the first black family. Because of that, when I moved to that neighborhood, I was the underdog, I was the outsider. And I was treated as such. I remember being on the bus and just, like smashed up against the the the, the glass, um, punched, kicked. You know, it's one of these where for, I mean, for no reason, like for no reason other than the color of my skin. Um, so that was that was growing up. And how has that manifested in your adult life? Oh, I'm a fighter. You know, I think that's really what I. You know, it's interesting. I even I notice when I walk into a room, I seek out the underdog and I try to champion them. So if I walk into a room, I'll look for the person who's hugging the wall, the person who's in the corner by themselves, and I will intentionally walk over to them, you know, try to befriend them. So th this, is, this has been this through line of my life is, is trying to champion people who I feel were the ones who were, you know, like me, you know, smashed up against the, the bus window. And you eventually went off to university, college? Yes. What career did you go into? immediately after college? Investment banking. Okay, interesting. Yes. Ended up hating it for the passion. Explain. Oh my God. I mean, you talk about eat you up, spit you out culture, you know? Like here's the best, here, here, here's, how, here's how I reminisce about investment banking. My boss at the time was 33 years old, right? Uh, multi-millionaire, he was considered one of the top 
so the division I was in was uh, was banks. We covered banks. So he was one of the top investment bankers, um, you know, covering banks, but top investment banker, right? His wife was pregnant at the time that we were working on a huge deal. It was the, at that time, it was the largest secondary offering in the history, right, of, of just history. But so it's a major deal. His wife is pregnant, first child. She's starting to give birth. He decides to come into work and he sends her to the hospital. And he comes into work and I'll never forget it. He's, he's, he's walking down the, the, the aisle. I'm like in a cubicle. He's got the office in front of me. He's walking down the aisle and people are standing up like this. Like, yeah, this is, that's right. You come here. This is the most important thing. Yeah, she, let her go off and do that, right? That was the moment where I said, this place is, this is like, this is crazy. You know, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. And so that was when I started thinking, okay, I need to, I need to get out of here. And then you went and worked for Enver? No, I didn't, I didn't go to Enver yet. Oh, okay. I went off to, I did what everybody does. I went to business school. Ah, okay. And so went to business school while I was, so while I was at business school, I met Enver Ujjal. I didn't start working for him, but I met him. Who was so, he? So he, at that time, multimillionaire, but he owned a, ma a massive company in Turkey. He was trying to extend his business in the United States. And when I met him, it was a professional relationship. And it was more so, hey, Paul, whenever I come to the United States, I'd love for you to help me to schedule meetings or help for you, uh, help me to get booked into people because I lived in Washington DC at the time and Capitol Hill was there, lots of senators and Congress people. And so it was easy for me to pick up the phone, work the, the, the network to get a meeting with, it could be Senator Hillary Clinton. And so I was helping him at the time. And then I came up with a concept to start a nonprofit organization and I needed to raise funding or I wanted to raise funding for it. And I decided that I would ask Enver to help me um, on this. So that's when I started working for Enver Ujel. How old are you at that age? I don't know, that's, uh, I'm 30. I'm in the, in, in the 30 zone. In your, early, in your early 30s, you start your, your matchmaking company. What was it about matchmaking that just connected with you inside and made you because in order to to be to get obsessed with anything to go and study it to to then pursue it for all these years it has to be connecting with you because of your experiences your biases your in a in a very particular way because i'm somewhat interested in it but i wouldn't dedicate my i wouldn't dedicate that kind of attention to it so what was it about you that resonated so much about bringing people together in such a way fair you, you know thinking about this for the first time is I'm actually connecting it to what you asked me with regard to how I grew up, right? Because to me, nearly every person who comes to a matchmaker, because keep in mind, you're probably spending 10 to $20,000, you know, for, for matchmaking services. You're probably allocating six to 12 months of your life to walk through that process. It, it is, it's a lot, right? And to me, every, the kernel, of every client is there, there's, there's, a, there, there's, there's a feeling of hopelessness. There's a feeling of, this is my last shot. You know, there's a feeling of, I am alone, you know, in, in, in this. And that's where I resonated. You know, I always talk about, I, you know, I don't know, in, in business, you know, we talk about this fifth why, right? The why that makes you cry. The, the why that when you're thinking about a customer, what are they thinking about at night? What's keeping them up right at night? And if you as an entrepreneur or a business owner, if you can help to solve that problem that's keeping them up at night, the why that's making them cry, well, that's, that's the, the secret sauce. But the key is that you have to be passionate about that, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going to take you a lot of you know, innovations and a lot of time, a lot of energy to figure out what the formula is. But for me, that that was what it was. It it was there was like this level of, like I'm I'm giving up hope, you know I'm I'm just 
I'm, I'm just done. And also it was for a particular avatar, which I think is also important for a particular customer. So, you know, what I've always learned in business is that you can't serve everyone, right? So it's important to find a particular customer, a specific demographic, a customer avatar, right? And look for the deepest pain point within that particular avatar. Now, when I got into the matchmaking space, I was the first, or what the Matchmaking Institute says, I was the first full-time black matchmaker in the United States, okay? In matchmaking, what a lot of people don't like to talk about what was happening is there was significant segregation happening in the matchmaking space. And what was happening is that in particular, black women were not being serviced by matchmakers for a variety of reasons, but they were not being serviced at all. So my first customer, my first avatar were black women in particular in the, uh, we call it the DMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And so there was a very particular pain point within the avatar, right? And so it was hopelessness, but it wasn't just hopelessness. Hmm. Now that I've described, you know, the avatar, right? Mm -hmm. This is someone who most likely, she's highly educated. She, she's making great money. She has uh, a, a child, you know. Um, she is an incredible uh, match for someone. So, so she became my first she became my first client and I was passionate. You know why? Because she was my sister-in-law. She was my auntie. You know, she was my cousin. I know her. I live with her. I've grown up with her. That was why I was so, you know, so passionate about her. What is what is the relationship your, your parents had and how has that influenced your work? Yeah, great, great one. They have had an incredibly loving relationship, you know, and, and, and not just my parents, but my grandparents. It's no surprise, is it? Because then you've had this, you know, staggering long relationship with Jill. It's funny how that, you know, those generational cycles play out over and over again, right? Yeah, and, and, that, and that's it. That's it. It's like, let's break the cycle. You know, we, we can break the cycle. That, that, was, that was part of it playing out. You know, with my wife, Jill, her parents, incredibly strong, right? her grandparents on both sides, incredibly strong, incredibly loving. It's an interesting question for anybody listening to this now, which is like, how much does your relationship currently, if you're in one, mirror that of your parents? And I think about, you know, even the, in my team here, the people that have the best relationships in my team, their parents have the best relationships and their partner's parents have the best relationships. Like just that solid best friend type vibes multi-decade best friend vibes in their parents. Yes. It's interesting. Yeah. And and I, so um, I agree. I think if we did that, we did a, a you know, longitudinal study around that, mm. we would find that to be precise. But part of what I think is driving it is, I mean, you could go back and look at attachment styles, but I think largely what's, what's driving that is, is, is seeing what love looks like modeled before you. Right, and know that it's not always uh, what we consider to be lovey-dovey. It can be contentious. A matter of fact, disagreements and arguments are important, are, 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 are critical, right? Because you need to almost break down the relationship in order to gain the skills to, 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 to bring it back up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it stronger. And so I think the modeling is, is, is key. It's so true. So true. I, and I've, it took me until I was 25 years to, old to figure this out, that modeling point, that the first model you've been given of love is your parents. So you believe that to be the truth about any person you then meet in your life. And so you, I, I can remember like almost in high definition in my mind, this image of looking over at my dad sat on the sofa and my mom just screaming at him and thinking, I'd fucking hate to be this guy. And then I go into life and I just avoid. Avoid, yes. Uh, avoid every, I, I'm obsessed about having control. Of yes. I mean, I've and heard you, you talk about this before. Yes, so. yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say yes. Yeah. I mean, th this is, that is prototype avoidant. Yeah, that's me. Attachment style. 
Yeah. Right. And and what's was so interesting to me about attachment style, which by the way, um, uh, it's uh, uh, Levine, Doctor Levine wrote a phenomenal book called Attached. Yeah, right. On this that I recommend for, for for everyone is you know there are primarily three categories of attachment. You have secure, you have anxious, and then you have avoidant. Right. And when you think about this, it's precisely what you just said, Stephen. Is that when you think of how you first saw love and you saw it modeled and you saw it relate to you, right? Was it one of which was secure in that you felt like you would be, you know, if you were hurt, you could go to a place for safety, right? You would be caressed, right? You'd be, you'd be, you'd be cared for, you know, that's secure. But then you move to the avoidant, right? Where it was you almost having to self-soothe yourself, right? Which then pushes you away from wanting to have have anything to do with that. And you become, you know what's interesting? The top, and this is just me guessing and observing, the top entrepreneurs are avoidance because they've had to develop the skills to self-sustain themselves, right? They've had to rely on themselves. People who are avoidant don't trust easily, but you trust yourself, right? So you look at that and you say, oh my God, like this came from me as a child. Like it's, it's incredible. And then with the anxious, the anxious is really interesting because the anxious was typically a lot of parents, like my situation where your parents worked all the time. So when they were home, they would be there to give you the love, but they couldn't be home all the time because they had to be, they had to work. So then you had to self-soothe a little bit. So then you became anxious about their love. Needy? Needy. And this is the person who's like texting you all the time. Like Steve, I know in the past, you must have had the, the girlfriend who was like, Stephen, where are you? Stephen, where no, are you? No comment. No, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Right? All of that shows up as adults. Right, uh, and and also this is, but but I guess long story short is to the point of when we've recognized that this is why being in a relationship with someone who is secure is so important because you can shift your style as an adult. You can be avoidant, be in a relationship with someone who's secure, and adapt to a secure attachment. Do you notice that? Do you notice that people who are avoidant tend to go for for people that are more secure? No, they go for for the anxious. Interesting. Right? Yeah, yeah. So they and, go for needy people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because Makes because sense. because yeah. Because I mean, becomes a bit of a you know, the, the they're they're chasing them and they're they're because you know you think about this. If you're avoidant, you're pretty much self sustained, right? But if someone is anxious, they're aggressively courting you, right? So they're pushing to be in your space, right? So the Secure, unfortunately, becomes boring for so many people. Safe, vanilla. <laughs> it's so true. I can't believe how true this is. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but 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 secure is where it's at. You know, it's where it's at. You want two secure people. You want a secure and anyone else. A strong secure could help bring could could help bring anyone over too. But also, you know, an avoidant and anxious can, can also, uh, you know, work. It's ultimately, to me, it's 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 about that effort. Is there such a way, to, so if I'm an avoidant, for example, or I'm an anxious, is there work I can do myself to become a secure without having to meet a secure and have them bring me over? Yes, absolutely. One of the top things someone who is avoidant can work on is their emotional intimacy. And that begins with simply recognizing their emotions, your emotions, and articulating them. It's, it's, it, seem, it actually seems easy, but it's incredibly challenging. So uncomfortable. So uncomfortable. Especially for a man. Yes. So for example, I could say, Stephen, how do you f- truly, how do you feel right now in this moment? Now, in this moment, very inspired and very keen to learn. Okay. More, but very, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you did that effortlessly, yeah, right? Yeah. But 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 now the next challenge would be okay. Well, do that with your you know with your romantic partner. 
yeah. right? And do it in spaces where you feel vulnerable. Yeah. It becomes very, very challenging to say how you feel, how someone makes you feel. It makes perfect sense because there was a void in my childhood of parenting, which I, I've always said has made, made me an entrepreneur. But in that void as well, there's a void of like um, learning affection. Uh, so okay. I, you know, I still call my parents by their first names. I've never called them mum and dad. I, we, we weren't like, there was no like, I love you or like hugging or stuff, stuff like that, mm -hmm. especially in my childhood. So learning later in life to then to be emotional and to express how I'm feeling and to, if your girlfriend says, what's wrong? Or, you know, how do you feel about this? I would, you know, I'd often just lie about how I was feeling just for keep things nice and calm. Right. Um, but I definitely, you know, it's definitely something I've had to learn. Right. But I, I, I can see that, that, so, I mean, you're a life learner, like you're, you're mm. a student of life. So I can see that you have begun, not even begun, you've, all, you've done the work, right? But for so many avoidance- I'd say begun. Begun, okay. Yeah. So, but for so many avoidance, that work has not yet begun. And being able to identify the emotion Mm. Right. And, and, and the feeling too, because, you know, and even distinguish between the emotion and the feeling, right. But to be able to, to distinguish that and then to be able to articulate that is so incredibly important because without that, you cannot have the emotional intimacy. And if you can't have emotional intimacy, you just simply can't have a relationship. You just can't. You, you have acquaintances, you know, you have coworkers, you know, um, you have uh, uh, situationships, you know, but you don't have relationships. That is a amazing soundbite. <laughs> Please cut that into a reel for TikTok <laughs> team listening. Um, so th th there's gender differences here as well, because of, of my friends, both women and men, I know for a fact that my male friends usually just push for like an easy life. Yeah, They just want, you know, if their partner's expressing emotional um, feelings or is expressing their emotions towards them, most of my male friends will see that as an attack, you know? And like, they, they just don't want to go there. It's, it's this energy that men just don't like. So I was watching this funny Twitter video before I came down here and it's this, the woman, she's cooked dinner for her husband and she's proving that men just won't tell you the truth. She puts loads of salt in it to make it taste awful. And she walks into the front room while he's watching the game. And she goes, try this, hun, tell me what you think. And you see his face just wink and it's fucking disgusting. And he goes, yeah, good. <laughs> and it, for me, it's summed up men. It's like, we just want to avoid the, the heat. Like, we, we, literally, li yeah, li yeah. literally. But you know, so I have a theory on this, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm testing this one out, right? But, but I call it the feedback loop theory. So my wife was in HR yeah. before she joined me in the matchmaking space. And one of the things that they would do uh, in their company, she worked in this law firm, is that they would, uh, you know, extensive feedback during the review period, extensive feedback. So, you know, how was your year? How did you perform all of these, these KPIs, right? And that feedback would translate into higher performance. I mean, just bottom line. And what I've noticed with women, typically, typically with women is that whenever there's a romantic experience, that romantic experience is then shared with like 10 of their friends. Hmm. You know, it's like go out on a date. The WhatsApp group knows everything that's happening in, in, on, on, on the date. And then there's a debrief of the date. There's an analysis of the date. Here's what he did. Here's what I wore, blah, 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 blah. And this happens for three days, constant feedback. And that feedback ends up making women, I think on average, better daters, right? Better equipped to deal and manage in relationships. Now, Stephen, when you were single, tell me this, if you were going on a date, right? Who did you talk to about the date? Nobody. <laughs> yeah. See, I just go. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's, all, it's all in your head. It's like, okay. I might tell one of my friends, I might say, oh, I saw this person the other night, you know, when I was single. I would have gone, you know, I, I saw Ruby like three days ago and she, that was, it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was like, all right, cool. Yeah. And that's yeah, it. And then that's move it. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's it. There's, there's no feedback. And think about this. Think about not that just happening on one date, but that happening 
month after month, year after year, 10, 15 years of no feedback, we're all in our head. We have no idea like how to perform, how to up our performance. And that impacts what happens when we eventually get into the relationship. So I, th I think the feedback loop, there's really something to it. And I've noticed it's primarily a, a gender difference. So are you saying also that because women are have a community where they're discussing stuff, they're discussing feelings and what happened and da-da-da-da-da-da, they try and bring that same energy to a man who's just not used to it. And he goes, fucking hell, like, I I don't know. Like, I, you know what I mean? And he's just like trying to avoid going there because he's never really had to go there before. Ne ne never, never had to, never had to. When you dig into the data, and this is what I love about love. Like in particular, I always say that my expertise is relationship science, right? I like to look at the science of love and look at how that impacts how we show up and why we show up. And the beauty of science is that if you can change the, the formula, not, not necessarily formula, if you change the equation, right? You change the result. And that's the beautiful thing. So if you are someone who is in a relationship and you're unsure how to communicate, there's certain things that you could change to make the communication stronger, and make the relationship better. Tell me what those are. Oh my God, there's, there's so there's many. So many I mean, yeah. <laughs> what are the like foundational things that have worked for you and your clients in terms of like communication, conflict resolution? Okay, great, great question. Uh, okay, so a couple things. And, and even with, uh, not only with my clients, but, but with my wife. You know, so th this this seems so basic. I think it's talked about, but not even talked about enough is Gary Chapman's five love languages. Mm -hmm. It seems so simple, but it literally changed my marriage. So by, you know, there's something called the, 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 the five-year itch and the seven-year itch, typically in marriages, not committed relationships, but marriages, where you literally see separation rates and divorce rates increase at that five and seven year mark, right? You also see it happen when uh, they become, when marriages become, you become empty nesters, your you know, kids go off to school. But right around that five and seven year mark, I was sleeping on the couch at my house. Like it was not good, you know, in our household. And this was so small, but so significant is, I bought Dr. Gary Chapman's five love languages, right? Which outlines, right, five ways that we recognize and see love. But here was the power of it. The power of it was that my wife, I thought she was spoiled because all she wanted was gifts. Like she was like, buy me this, buy me that. It's my birthday, buy me this. It's Christmas, buy me this. It's Monday, buy me this, right? It was buy me, buy me, buy me, mm. right? And I thought to myself, Jesus, she's spoiled. Like, this is crazy. So what do I do? Steven, I bet you, you would do the same thing. You know what I did? Well, I said, I'm not gonna buy you anything, mm. you know? Cause you're spoiled. I'm gonna change this behavior. You know, I'm not gonna buy you a thing. So what happens when it's her birthday, it's Christmas, it's the anniversary, it's Monday and I'm not buying her anything? Oh man, like hell, it becomes hell. But it was Dr. Gary Chapman's book that helped me understand that the way that my wife grew up, the way that she saw love through her parents were through gifts. Her father spoiled her to death, right? And her father loved her and showed his love, showered his love through gift, through gift giving. So she, as a little girl, is growing up thinking, okay, you know, I get the doll, I get this, I get this, right? This is love, this is love, this is love. Her love language is legitimately gifts. I had to understand that fundamentally to understand that this is how she will see that I love her. It's not just simply through maybe what's, you know, uh, you know, acts of service, which is, which is my love language, mine. right? Do something on my <laughs> behalf, yeah. right? So I would do something on her behalf, right? But no, it, it was, it's gifts. And then for her to know, okay, for me, it's acts of service. So if she, you know, she was big on gifts, giving me gifts. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't resonate with this. You know, I don't, I don't get this. And so the understanding, truly understanding your partner's love language 
And then giving them love in that language is a game changer. And a quick way to determine someone's love language is just observe how they show love to the people they love, right? What do they do, right? That's, that's a quick way. So, so, so love languages, game changer, game changer, right? So, so that's one. Um, secondly is to, uh, I think to, to understand that you, you need to argue, right? But great relationships are bids. You're putting in bids. It's a constant tennis match. That's a great relationship, constant tennis match. So what that means is that you are showing through your action, through your love language, through your words, et cetera, but you're showing that you love your partner and you're doing that consistently over and over and over and over and over again. And what your partner is going to be doing is they're gonna hit that ball back to you and you're gonna hit that ball back to them. But you have to remember this one thing. Sometimes you have to hit the ball five times over right? The net before they return the ball to you. And ultimately what that means is that you have to consistently remind your partner. So you could be, I'm 21 years into my marriage. People think, all right, you're 21. You're good. You don't have to do anything now, right? You're smooth sailing. No. When I get home today, I am still showing up, recognizing that I have to continually put those bids in. You know, I always say it's like Janet Jackson, what have you done for me lately? That's truly what a relationship is, is that it's constantly, it's this constant, constant, right? And then part of that, that constant too, and maybe this is just a third concept, super simple, but intentional time, intentional time. So, so what, what I find really interesting is you look at how much time we spend with our, our partners or our spouse. It's one to two hours a day on average. On average, the average married couple spends one to two hours per day. So you think about that. You're probably spending more time with the bus driver than you are with, with, with your spouse. And then in the one to two hours, what are you actually doing? It's like ships passing in the night. You know, no real conversation. One's watching TV in this side. One's on the computer over here. No real communication. And what ends up happening is you're not able to exchange ideas. You're not able to talk about, you know, dreams. You're not able to talk about hopes. You're not able to talk about your feelings. You know, you're not able to connect intentional time spent. I always say that, you know, effort always equals interest, but whatever is important to you in life. You have to be intentional about spending time on it, you know? And that includes the relationship, that includes it. And so intentional time, so that may mean, okay, every Friday we're having dinner together or every night we're having dinner. In my household, it's every night we have dinner together as a family. I help, I try to rearrange my schedule so that I'm at home with my family having dinner. And if I get home, too late to have dinner with my boys. My wife and I are having dinner at 11 p.m., 12 midnight, but we are communing together, right? This is very important. Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, weekly dates, but the whole bottom line is spending time. This Saturday, my wife and I, we have a date, right? Yeah, 21 years into our marriage, still planning dates, still excited about the dates. It's intentional time spent intentional time spent. So, the, I mean, there, there's, there's so many concepts, but I would say that if you just do those, if, if you just think about that, those basics, love language, right? Understanding that relationships are always a bid. It's always a bid back and forth, always. And sometimes you have to bid five, six times before you get the ball back, right? But it's, it's always bid. And then it's intentional time spent. You, you know, you you, you, typi you typically you typically grow together opposed to growing apart. You're on the couch, five years in, right? Yes. The the only way off that couch, with all of those things said, is like communication. You have to at some point you're going to have to have a tough conversation about something. Yes. Um, in business, in life, and in everything, um, what I've noticed is most of the issues I have in my life. Uh, have become big issues because I didn't have an honest com conversation about something sooner when I knew it was a problem. So I deferred it, I knocked it back, whatever. Um, the art of having a 
good, healthy conversation with someone, with a partner, with someone you love, when there's a lot of emotion and tension, is something that I don't think we've talked about enough in, in society. Specifically, men really struggle, I think, with that. How does how does one have a, a good re- conflict resolution orientated conversation without, you know, fucking screaming or walk running out or whatever, or blame, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. And and, and I agree. And, I, and I, I hear this this term uh, passed around a lot and I agree with it is, is that the more challenging conversations you have in life, the higher quality your life is. Because most of us try to run away, as you're saying, right? So I think there are a couple things that we could do. One is sometimes you won't be equipped to have that conversation or your partner won't be equipped to have that conversation. That's the importance of having a third party, right? This is the reason why, you know, therapy is so incredibly important. And I, and I, and I really try to preach this because I feel like the UK is a little bit behind the US, you know, when it comes to that is therapy is sexy. You know, having a counselor is sexy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So having a third party, a professional one, that's very important. Secondly is, is, uh, is, is context. Picking the right moments to have these challenging conversations, picking the right environments to have these conversations are incredibly important, right? You could, you could, we could decide that we can have this argument in the kitchen when we know that the boys have to be in bed in five minutes, and I know it's been a long day for you, and I haven't slept last night, we can have this conversation right now if you want to. It's probably not going to go in the direction we want it to. Or we could wait and hold on until Saturday when we're both taking that walk back from dropping the boys off at, at, their, at, their, at their class, and we have 10 minutes to sit in the park and talk about this. So to have the right context is incredibly, incredibly important. Third, I think if, if I'm given top three, is to actually set rules and boundaries. And this does not happen enough in relationships. And I always say that if you don't set boundaries, you will take even well-intentioned partners and turn them into bullies if you don't set your boundaries. So you have to set your boundaries from the beginning of the relationship but in particular, when you're having these tough conversations and boundaries could be as simple as we're going to focus on one topic. When you're having a a discussion, the discussion should be about the topic at hand, right? But setting what those boundaries are ahead of time, because typically what ends up happening is fights become unfair, right? It's healthy to fight, but it's unhealthy to fight in an unfair manner. So I think th- those are those are three three techniques that I know that you know Jill and myself that we use when we are having our discussions. Quick one from our longest standing sponsor, Hill. I I can't tell you over the last I'd say over the last really it's been about two and a half years. It was really um, post pandemic how much my health has become such a huge priority in my life. Huel has been probably the most important partner in my health journey because I've been in the boardrooms, I've been to their offices tens and tens and tens and tens of times. I've seen how they make their decisions on nutrition and I trust it. I trust the brand to keep me nutritionally complete. And that is something that I fight for every single day in the chaos and the busyness of my life. And that's why it's such, such a wonderful thing to be able to talk to this audience about a brand and a product that is so unbelievably linked to my values and the, and the, the place I am in my life of valuing the gym, exercise, movement, my mind, my breathing, and all of those things. And most importantly, my nutrition. That is the role Huel, Huel plays. And so if you haven't already tried Huel and you've been resistant to my my pestering, then give it a go and let me know how you get on. Quick word from one of my sponsors. Um, super excited to announce that our new sponsor for the podcast is Intel, a brand that pretty much every single person listening to this is a user of, but in some cases you might not even know. For those that don't know, Intel is a technological powerhouse who have been driving technology, innovation and transformation for more than 50 years. We all know that technology has never been more important than it is today. And Intel is truly shaping the future of our industry from keeping us connected through 5G, which we use 
in all of our lives every single day, to modernizing computers, to transforming businesses through data and analytics, the list goes on and on and on. I've been particularly excited to announce the sponsorship because we've been using Intel's technology throughout this building and on this podcast for some time now, and it makes our lives so much easier in so many ways, especially as it relates to producing this show for you. So head over to intel.co.uk and you can find out why they've become an essential piece of technology in my day-to-day routine. Let me know what you think. At some point, um, you started a YouTube channel yeah. and Oprah got in touch. Yes. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's it's uh, it's crazy. But it, it is, uh, you know, so when I decided to launch my matchmaking business after I'd spent a year prepping, I didn't know how to launch it. And it was my wife and my best friend at the time who said, you know, you should focus on the marketing aspect of this. You should start a YouTube channel. Now this is 2009. So like- Early. Early. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Were you born in 2009? Just about. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, so 2009, so YouTube isn't a big, it's a thing. It's not as big a thing as it is right now. Mm. It's not known as the go-to place to market your new company. Um, But I decided to create a YouTube series called The Modern Day Matchmaker. And what I decided is I would pump all of my money into this thing. And I I mean, when I look around the studio, this (laughs) is an impressive studio. Um, I had like one out of 10 of these cameras. I had like one (laughs) camera, you know, but... It was me spending a thousand to four thousand dollars per production minute, right? So we had a team. Yeah, yeah, I know it's crazy, it's ridiculous. But the reason why is because I thought I had a unique point of view, and if I can just push that out into the marketplace, I could distinguish myself from the competitors. And I would put out this video every week, man, and nobody would watch it. Nobody. And and I say this, and this is not even a joke, is every week it would get like 11 or 12 views, this video. And my mother was watching nine of those, hmm. you know? And so it was, no one was watching this thing, but I thought this was a way for me to, you know, for, for, for me to at least create my brand within the space. Now it turns out, that one of those 11 views was Oprah. But people say, hey, like, okay, how, how did Oprah find you? You know, mm. the reason why Oprah was able to find me is because a year prior, I was doing pro bono matchmaking services. Free work. Free work. One of my clients, and I had no idea, but one of my clients was a writer for O Magazine. Year later, she's on Oprah's jet. Oprah says, I have a concept for a new TV show. I'm looking for a fresh voice. My client in the jet says, have you heard of Paul Brunson? Oprah says, no, but let me see. YouTube search, Paul Brunson, save. Let me start watching. So Oprah was watching this YouTube series and, and you know, When I always look at it, I say, gosh, to me, it is a powerful story because she ends up offering me a job to co-host a television show with her on her brand new network off of this YouTube series that no one was watching but Oprah, my mother, and like two other people. And I say it's a powerful story about quality over quantity. You know, I think we live in a day and age where you know, vanity metrics in particular are, are, are everything. You know, it's like, I need to have this number of followers, this number of views, and I get it. To a certain extent, it is important when you're monetizing, but ultimately the who that's watching is more important. And it was, it was through that, that, you know, that, that YouTube series that I, I got the job and, it, and working with Oprah changed my life. There's this thing called la- like lagging metrics um, in, KPIs in business and analytics where they're they're metrics that show up later Mm. once you've done the input, once you've done the work. And and I was thinking about that as you were speaking because you were doing, you were doing, focusing on quality now. The lagging metric was that you were going to become on Oprah Winfrey's show and she was going to watch. 
but you were just planting the seeds of quality. And, and like, I'm sure that if you'd carried on doing that channel for 15 years, <laughs> it would have probably had 15 million subscribers. Right. But, but it's, it's fun. I always think about it like seeds, even with, even what, with what we've done here, if I showed you the graph of the growth of the Diary of CEO, it's literally, this is no exaggeration. I posted on my Twitter the other day, it's two years flat. flat. Right. Now what happens next is it goes like a like a vertical lineup. Wow. wow. And you never know when or how or whatever, but those first two years when it was flat was when all of those seeds were being planted and really where you're you're learning your craft. And I think so many people um it's an important for so many people because the big metrics always lag behind and things go fast then um things go slow then fast. Yes. And uh, we sometimes can get super impatient about why, why, why hasn't Oprah called me yet? Or why don't I have a big podcast with 10, 15 million downloads? Why don't I have that yet? But you're doing the work now to have that in that quiet period. And I loved what you said there about like the quality. Like if you just focus on quality, which is something you know you can control, just making whatever you're doing now, like the best. Yes. You have nothing to worry about. You don't need to worry, you just need patience. Yes. Yes. And and I love that when I hear that that story because 11 views and one of them fucking Oprah is just yeah it's 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 a mind blow. It's a it's a mind blow. And and I think too, to to even add to what you're saying is I think that that's the key of having the passion because that's I mean that's the reason why you like you yeah the, you keep on keeping on. You, you keep on keeping on cuz yeah. cuz otherwise the first hurdle you hit you give up. Right. And, you and you should, because 11 views, you're fucking stupid. Go get a job, Paul. <laughs> Do you know that's, what I mean? That's what my yeah. father was saying. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine? He was like, what are you doing? Mm. You just came from investment banking. Like, mm. I mean, honestly, Stephen, the amount of people who thought I was crazy, mm. like, commit this guy. He left investment banking, and he's doing YouTube videos out of his bedroom, mm. and he's not paying for his mortgage, right? His wife, my wife liquidated her retirement fund. So, so we had burned through our money. She liquidates her retirement fund. And we start using that as capital for the business. And the capital is being used for a YouTube series that 11 people are watching. Like people thought I was nuts. That's it. I think Steve Jobs said it. He said, you know, there's going to become a day when you're doing what you're doing, where any sane person would give up. And they should give up, but faced with the facts and numbers that you'll see before you. But those that keep going are those that are doing it for that really deep internal reason. And like right. one of the things I know for sure is that no matter what business you start, unless you're very, very lucky, exceptionally lucky, you're going to have those days. And there's not going to be one of them. It's going to be, for most people, a week, months, sometimes multiple years where everything is saying you're an idiot. You right. should stop. Right. And the only way you grace those hurdles is because, sometimes because you don't have a plan B, that's a very good way to just keep on keeping on. <laughs> but because it's a challenge that you must pursue, right. regardless of remuneration or outcome, it's for you. And so when I bet on entrepreneurs, especially when I'm investing in them, I'm looking for that. I'm like, I because I don't, I don't know always a ton about the industries, but what I do know is a ton about the nature of business. And I know your hard days are coming. How will you respond for that three years where everything, everything is going is, bad? Right. Resilience, you know, purpose, all of those sort of key indicators. So Oprah, you yes. end up working with Oprah on her show. I guess I've got two questions. First one is, what did you learn from Oprah working mm. so closely with her? Mm. Well, the first thing I learned was not to call her Oprah. Oh, really? <laughs> Shit. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, you can call. If you were working for her, She's Miss Winfrey. That was the first thing I learned. Someone corrected me very quickly. I was like, oh, no, they said, no, Miss Winfrey, you know? Uh, so that, that was the first thing. But she is everything you can imagine that she is times 100. But also too, what was interesting to me about, about Miss Winfrey, about Oprah, is that when she would speak, you never knew if she was talking about the event in the immediate or if she's giving you some, you know, life advice. Like I remember the, the very first scene I shot with her was we were in Georgia. So we shot a show called Love Town USA. I actually did two shows with Oprah, but the first one was Love Town USA. And there's 
10,000 people in this audience. They're all there to see Oprah. There's this massive light kit on stage. It's big. It's my first big event ever. I've never spoken in front of 10, like I've never spoken in front of 10 people, you know, 10,000 people. And the director comes over and he was like, all right, Paul, get up on stage, hit your mark and introduce Oprah. I was thinking, hit my mark? What is a mark? Yeah. Like, what does that mean? And I'm freaking out, I'm sweating. And Oprah comes over to me, real calm, cool, puts her hand on my, on my shoulder. She's like, all right, baby, look, this is, it's, it's real simple. You just walk on that stage, keep walking till you feel the light hit you the brightest. That's where you stay, right? And I was thinking to myself, is she talking about the stage? Is she talking about life? Right, like, yeah. what, what? cause that's deep, you know? But that's how she would speak. Um, and she was uh, she, she, she just, just amazing. Just, just amazing, amazing, amazing person. Why is she successful in your assessment? Why is she Oprah? Oprah? What is it about her? Yeah, so, so I, I studied her, you know, I'm a people watcher, you know, uh, and I worked for, so I worked for Oprah after I worked for Enver. And the similarity to me is that when I started working for Enver, he went from multimillionaire to billionaire. And that to me was, was really interesting because of how few billionaires you know, there are in, in, in the world. So I started to journal what I learned from Enver. Then I start working for Oprah and I noticed similarities. And what was wild to me is here are two people who are completely different, you know, one woman, one man, one from the US, one Turkey, one married, one not, one Christian, one Muslim. It's like completely different, but yet they had these same characteristics. And for Oprah in particular, you know, I noticed we used to go on these road shows for the show to sell the show to, to advertisers. And before the road show, she would also, she would always host a dinner. And these dinners, there would be, you know, 20, 30 people at the dinner. You'd have all types of athletes and politicians. And, uh, you know, she would have her, her, she would bring her, some of her girls from her school in South Africa would also be at the table. It would be this potpourri, this eclectic buffet of various people. And she would sit and she would conduct these, these amazing dinners. And I realized that at these dinners, that was her education, was, was the dinner. Like she was being educated on what was happening in the world, what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Because she had a lot of the playmakers at the table. She was learning about different perspectives. She was teasing out her own ideas and debating them before she would take them on screen. She would do this in these intimate dinner settings. And I noticed Enver would do the same thing. Massive dinners, 20, 30 people every night he would have these massive dinners and he would do the same thing. They, they, they would, they would, you know, they, they, the concept is never eat alone. You know, Keith Ferrazzi has a book called Never Eat Alone, which I think is a phenomenal book, but it's about the power of socializing and the power that you get from, from essentially strengthening your, the weak ties in your network. Interesting. Yes. I think I'm quite bad at socializing. You, you, you know, so, I, I, I was going to say, I, I'm wondering if there's like a digital equivalent or if like, I'm doing it right now. Yes. See, I think this, this is your extension, but so, okay. So let's, let's even tease this out a little bit. So Mark Granovetter, who was a Stanford professor came up with this theory of, of weak ties, right? Mm. So if you take Robin Dunbar, right, who has the Dunbar rule, we have roughly 150 friends essentially, right? You could debate it out, yeah, but yeah. on average, right? Um, if you think about your 150th friend, the weakest friends, right? The 140th friend, right? Acquaintance. Acquaintance, yeah. right? Those are where our biggest opportunities in life come. That's where deals come for our business. That's where we get introduced to spouses, right? That's where you know, tickets to the football game. come. It comes from the weakest ties opposed to our nearest and dearest, which you think about, you think, God, is that even logical? But it is. Our weakest ties drive the most opportunity in our life. But what do we do? Most of us, we spend all of our time where? 
with the people closest to us. But what Oprah and Enver do, and what Mark Granovetter talks about with this theory is that the key is to constantly be strengthening our weak ties investing in those weak ties, adding new people in to our weak ties, kicking other, other people out. And that's what they're, they're doing. Those people at that table, those were not her besties. Those were not her top five, right? Those were her 120th, 130th. And that's where the enormous opportunity comes in. Interesting. So your matchmaking business becomes, from what I read, one of the largest matchmaking companies in the United States. Yes. How long did that take? The, the Paul C. Brunson agency. Oh my God, that was 2000. So it was 2008 to 2016. So eight years. Who of all the, the avatars of the sort of personas do you find struggles with being alone the most? Oh my, you, you know what? Men. Really? Yeah. And I would even say, uh, you know, I mean, you know, there's a whole incel movement, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, and you know, there's lots of articles now about the, the, the rise of, of the lonely man, you know? Uh, but quite honestly, or at least from experience, remember this is 2016, slightly, you know, slightly different time, but successful men. And I, when I say financially successful, so those who were the investment bankers who 45 years old, retired from investment banking, thinking about their next career, divorced twice, sitting at home alone, right? That's where the struggle, that's where it hits you. You know, when you realize, oh my God, I'm 45. I, I'm, I'm, I've only lived half my life, you know? And here I am alone. And I'm a dick on top of it, right? So that's, that was, that was the demo that was, there was a struggle. I gotta be honest. When I asked you that question about which group of people would struggle the most with loneliness, my head bounced around. I thought, I think he's going to say potentially um, younger men because of this whole incel thing where, you know, I don't want to get into the mass shootings and stuff, but kid, you know, young men who have, I had a guest on this podcast, Scott Galloway, who talked about how like 90% of the female attention, even when you think about things like Bumble, goes to like the top the, the five, top. 10% yes. of men. Yes. And then you've got this kind of, the other 40% do okay. Then you've got the bottom 50% of men that are totally just not getting, that haven't been laid for, for more than a year. I think that's what he said. Um, so I thought maybe you'd go for them. Then I thought he's going to say 30 plus women mm. because of things like biological clocks and stuff like that. Right. Um, and this sort of social pressure, which I, I, for, I've heard from guests here, that some women can feel because of society's expectations and timelines to like, to hurry up and be married. So I thought you would say one of those two groups. So to hear you say a completely different group. Yeah was quite surprising. Yeah, no, I hear you. And, and, and what you just said, that's a logical, it's a logical breakout. Mm -hmm. But for me, and this is my experience is dealing with those who are seeking matchmaking, you know, is that the thought is my time is over. You know, my, my, the, the heyday is gone, you know? It's kind of like the, the athlete that is now retired, but, want, but still desires to play but realizes that they don't have, you know, they don't have it anymore. But a rich 40, 40 year old man yes. has got options. Has, you know what, a rich 40, yeah, ha, has options. But, but we're talking about loneliness though. Okay, Right. loneliness, yeah. And there's an emptiness that does come over you when you realize, you know, so a large part of loneliness, unfortunately, is through comparison. Cause you know, this whole idea, when we compare, we despair we despair upon ourselves. So a large part of that is, is that you look across your peers and you say, look at this now, Stephen's married, you know, he's two children, you know, and I'm, yeah, I'm out here. I have my Ferrari, you know, but I come home to myself. In my big house. In my big, in my massive house. <laughs> yeah. And there's, there's, and there's no one here with me. And you're astute enough to know that 
all of those people who you thought were loyal to you were actually not loyal to you, but they were just loyal to their circumstances with you. And the job and stuff, yeah, yeah. The yeah. job, right, Ex exactly. So you, so you begin to understand, oh my God, they're not my friends. I, I, have, I, I, I have no one. And so when you have someone to go to a matchmaker, typically they have reached the end of their line when it comes to their hope, you know? And I think that from my peers who are of that age, or I'll say of that vintage, right? Um, that it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly sad. It, it, it's, just, it's just incredibly sad. Now, I think what women do tremendously well, or should I say better than men of that age, is they understand how to build community. Mm. And that's something that goes back to what we were talking about before. The, we talked about, you know, the, the feedback loop. We talked about, uh, you know, challenges around being emotionally available, especially at an early age, understanding how to build emotional intimacy. Mm. The, these, these things all play themselves out, not only in our romantic relationships, but in our platonic relationships. And what we have to understand is that the, the stronger platonic relationships we have, the more health we have, the longer we live, the more money you know, you know, we, we make. You know, I have, a, so I have a, it's my wife's uh, aunt. She is 111 years old. Jesus. So she's one of the oldest human beings right now on the planet. She's 111, incredibly astute. And when I sit down, I just sit down and I'm just, I absorb everything that she says. And what I realize is she still has friends. Like at 111, she's friends that she talks to every day. You know, that's how you stay alive. You know, we, we focus and I get it you know, gut health is so important and low cholesterol is so important. Yeah, I, I, I get it, right? Exercise is so important, right? I get all those things are so important, but I would argue that our social connections are even more important. And we have to understand how to build the skills. And you do that before. Like I always say, the best time to work on your marriage is before you get married. You know, the best time to work on your friendships before you have your friend, right? We need to develop these skills early on. Someone said to me, in fact, yesterday, so it rings so true to what you're saying, that um, we were talking about resilience. And they said, we used to think of resilience as like being tough yourself. But when, when we look at different people, the resilience comes from being surrounded by commu a supportive community. And that, in fact, makes a person, an individual resilient, psychologically resilient. So when I think about that investment banker that's 45 years old and alone, he doesn't have a community to help keep his psychological resilience in place. And there's this thing, there's this really interesting study that I that I read about, um, and this goes back to our sort of ancestral backgrounds where we lived together in these tight-knit communities where if someone, the reason why when people are lonely, they they live less long and they're more susceptible to illness, disease, and all of these other things is because Scientists have seen that the brain literally goes into a state called self-preservation mm. where your sleep, so think about it. If you left your tribe and you're out on the, I don't know, the Serengeti when we were, I don't know, tens of thousands of years ago, whatever, everything's cha everything changes in terms of your, your keeping yourself alive. You can't sleep the same. So they observe the brain of someone who's lonely and they struggle with sleep because we've been programmed to fucking stay up because the lion might be coming. coming right, and this is really right. interesting. There's all these dots are connecting in my brain now because I started learning about this thing called chronotypes where all of us in a group of 20, 30 people, what you'll find is they all have completely different sleeping rhythms when they get hungry, when they're most creative, when they have the most power. So I'm an owl. My, my, my partner, yeah was was the opposite. Yes. And the reason why we have the different chronotypes, again, it goes back to the tribal days where like, we didn't all want to sleep at the same time right. or be right. alert at the same time. So we created a community where we're basically one shield of the tribe to survive. And thinking about that guy who's 45 years old, he's got the bag, but he's lonely as fuck. He's in self-preservation. Yeah, that's a great point. You know? That's he, 
as physiologically, your brain is completely different uh, when you fall into a state of loneliness and because your body's trying to help you survive right. in this danger, potentially dangerous world from the lions out there. Yeah. The other thing they noticed was when someone was lonely is their levels of resentment, like the snappiness, the like anger, the vis all mm. of that went up as well. And that links to what you said about they don't learn the skills, the skills. To, to form connections because they've got so used to self-defense, like psychological self-defense. Yeah, yeah. And I can see that if you're in that state, then you just delve deeper into that mm. as each year goes. Like you become a curmudgeon, like you become a recluse, just, yeah. Yeah, recluse, curmudgeon. It's just, yeah. it's that, that to me is sad because you have someone who you, per you perceive them to have it all, yeah, but they really have nothing. And it makes sense because if I was, if I got used to being alone, say I was on the, in the, I don't know, I don't even know where prehistoric humans used to live, just in the savannah of Africa, let's <laughs> yeah. put us there because we're all from Africa. Right. And I've got so used to living alone, when I see someone else or a tribe, I'm not going to run up and be like, hey, hey. I'm going to think these fuckers are going to kill, kill me. me. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to hide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Trust goes down. You're, yes. you're, you're apprehensive. Yes. You know, all of those things that you actually described early on, that happens and that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. What do you do though? So in that case of that investment banker, what is step one to get them from that point where they're on the couch, they've got all that money in that mansion, they're alone, how to get them out there and find someone to love them? Yeah, I mean, therapy. You, you know, with so with matchmaking, one of the things that we introduced, we, we were pioneers in many ways. One way is that you would come to us and we wouldn't just simply find dates for you. We, you would come to us and then we would assign you to a therapist that you'd work with for three to six months before you went on your date, right? So there's this rehabilitation, you know, that takes place. And, and, and what I always say about therapy too, is it's not, you go to a therapist and you're fixed, you know, it's you begin to build the muscle and you continue that, right? So that would be a place to begin. Secondly is to begin friendships is where I would go. So it's not like, okay, how can I place you in a community of 10 people, but how can I find one person that you could begin to build a relationship with and start with building rapport, you know, very basic, very, you know, very, very basic, very slow, but that's how I would begin. You, you know, also talking about that particular client, cause you know, it's, it's been some while since I've been matchmaking, but now he's coming back to me. Um, very, you know, what I found with men of that particular vintage, right? And the dating scene is, is that the, a lot of the, the body movements were, were, I would call odd, right? The, there was a social ineptness, you know, um, that needed to be worked out, you know, body length, we, we say more with our body than, than we do with our words. And there was a uncomfortableness, you know, that, took months to, to tease out. And this is especially if you are coming from a career where you are the authority, you are the boss, mm. you're, 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 you're the top dog. So you don't have a level of, uh, no one is critiquing your body language, right? But now you move to a social situation where your entire interaction is largely based on your body language it's, it's, it's a different situation. So it takes, it takes months, right? Or it could take years, but it takes a while of work before, you know, before we, we begin the matchmaking. I'm like slowly developing a theory on awkward huggers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Those people that are like, ah, they, they look away when they come in to hug you. They kind of give you a tap on the back. And oh my they, gosh. Yeah. Can I, okay, can we talk about hugging for a second? hundred percent. I noticed that men do this. So, so I have a buddy named Tom Reed Wilson, who's on one of the shows with me. And he taught me something that I now pay close attention to. So most men, I notice, hug and tap the back. Get the fuck off me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, right? But what Tom taught me is the hold and embrace. Mm. and hold an embrace for 30 seconds, which is a long freaking time to embrace someone. Wow. And what he taught me was that in that embrace to notice how uncomfortable the person is with you. There's a, okay, you're gonna let me go. It's, this is odd. Mm. Now this is not to a stranger, but this is, this is someone who you would hug opposed to the pat 
is 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 the hug. That to me is wild. But here's an here's another wild one that men do. This I learned this from Robin Dunbar also mm. in his book Friendship. Is and and if you see two men talking to each other at a party out on the street, they normally stand at at like a hundred and twenty degree angle. Rarely do they stand like this. Never would they stare like this because going back to us on the Serengeti, right? This is very confrontational, right? This means we're about to kill each other, yeah. you know? But like this, we're safe. You know, if we cheat our bodies like this, 120 degree. And, and if you notice that, men do that all the time. Now, ladies walk right up yeah. and be all Grab like, behind. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, girl? You know, but men, it's like, okay, I'm gonna yeah, talk. Yeah. Oh, right. oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, don't hug me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but but, but the, the, these, the, see, these are all things that we, we laugh and we joke about, but it suggests why we could have challenges in our intimate relationships. One of the things I've been curious about that I have a lot of question marks around is this idea of compatibility mm. and who who we're compatible with. Are we just, you know, because when we think about dating, we often think about it like we're trying to find this perfect individual that we could kind of draw on a piece of paper that has all of these particular qualities. We think we know who we're looking for. Um, is that true? What what do I need to know about like what truly makes someone compatible? Because I think once upon a time, for sure, for sure, I would have said I want my partner to be probably like me. Right. I would have said okay, <laughs> if I can run a huge business and so we can talk about it in bedtime and right. That, that, I don't think that's the case <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my my joke is that most men who came to us, right, they want themselves with a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much that's, yeah, yeah. that's pretty much what they're looking for, yeah. right? Um, so uh, this is a topic that's you know I've been studying forever, and there's a lot of different thoughts around it. Like if you just think about dating apps, they spend an enormous amount of money trying to perfect the algorithm to you know to, the matching algorithm. It's all about that, and if you look at the success rate, so the percentage of people who are using dating apps and then end up in a committed or a committed relationship or marriage and then stay in that for a fixed amount of time, like 10 years, it's like less than 2%. So you think, okay, so they haven't gotten it right. There's certain matchmakers that profess to have almost near 100% success rates. And you say, what do they do? You know, I have some friends who just say, oh, I can just look at you and tell. And you're like, whatever, you're like, you know. But over time, there are certain areas that I firmly believe, firmly believe, determine whether or not you have strong compatibility, right? So one, we've already talked about attachment style. Yeah, I think attachment style, incredibly important. We've talked about values. Values, incredibly important. That's the rule book to life, right? Another part of it is your ability to communicate. So there's this theory called decide versus slide. Right, it's a theory that a lot of, uh, you know, you have you have people like uh, John Cotman's behind this, but you have people in the states who have looked at when you're with your partner, can you make a decision together on anything? Let's say you're with your partner and you decide, okay, we're going on vacation. Can you actually make decisions on where you're going without killing each other? Like, can you decide what you're going to eat without killing each other? Like, can you actually make collaborative decisions that is deciding versus sliding. What a lot of relationships, what a lot of couples do is they say, okay, no, you decide that. You, you pick where we're going to go. I'll decide where we're going to do, right? It's a slide. It's not a collaborative. So when you were uh, dating, when you're engaged, it's very important to begin to look at are you making decisions together? Do you have the ability to make decisions together, right? Deciding versus sliding, very important. Another one that's touchy for a lot of people, but it is what it is, is, you know, do you have physical attraction? There's, there's a massive debate. I, I don't understand why there's still a debate over this, is that every bit of science suggests to us that if you have zero I'm talking about zero physical attraction. It's going nowhere. Like it's going nowhere. But if you have minimal physical attraction, it doesn't mean rip the clothes off energy. 
But if you have minimal physical attraction, then that could build. Because you could be, you know, you could be sapiosexual, where it's the intellect that drives you, but you still have to have a minimal level of physical attraction. And then what we see is that over time, attraction can definitely grow, but it needs to start somewhere. So you think about physical attraction, you think about the ability to make decisions, compatibility in values, also attachment style. These become, I think, the foundational pieces to having a, a, a compatible relationship. But then there's this small little piece that I wanna throw out. And this is some studies that have been done in the US that I find to be fascinating is the marriage rate, you know, in the UK as well, it, it, it hovers, you know, between let's say 35 and 50%, depending on who, who you're talking to, or should I say the divorce rate does, 35 to 50%. So the idea is there that almost half of people who, who, who get together end up getting a divorce on average. Now, if you were to just take out couples who have been engaged for two years, what do you think that does to the divorce rate? So they've been engaged for two years and then they get married. Uh, I think the divorce rate goes down. Exactly. It goes down dramatically. Some people say it goes down to 20. 20, 22%, right? Chance of getting divorced if you've been, if you had a long engagement. Yes. Now, why would that be? The reason why is because you're able to test out all of these theories. You're able to see your partner in the most adverse circumstance and see, do they still show up as, as yeah, so true. yeah, can they still make a decision with me, yeah. you know? Or do they emotionally shut down and, and, and they go away? So then when you look at, why or the couples where you see divorce being prevalent, it's in couples in one of two categories. One, they've known each other for a year or less, right? It's quick. Or when I say know each other, they've been in a committed relationship for a year or less, or they've been in a committed relationship for like 10 years. And it's like, basically, you know, it was an ultimatum. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's the reason why, why, why they were married. So the two years, of engagement I think is incredibly important because it allows you to test out these compatibility metrics. Two things there. So the first one I wanted to just jump back to because I found it really interesting and it's something I've thought about a lot because of some of my friends okay. in my circle is can you be, because you talked about physical attraction, can you be physically attracted to somebody but then not have sexual attraction. Ah, uh, okay. I say this because I remember in a past relationship, I was physically attracted to her, but sexually, I just, it just didn't work. Right. And that's why that relationship ended. She was this beautiful, beautiful girl. Her, her breath, like her mind, her intellect, she was super smart. She was super funny. She was just everything. I think there's a point before we went to have sex, mm -hmm. that I thought, this is it. This right. is the one. We then went to have sex and I, oh, I've never said this before. I remember getting up and going over to my phone and like afterwards, like and saying to one of my best mates, I just go, I don't think I can ever see her again. See, I, I wonder how much of this though plays into to, to, to foreplay. Really, Cause have you, have you heard about uh, erotic blueprint? I've this, heard about it. I okay. think I heard it on that Goop show. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was it was on Goop too. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I watched yeah. that. Yeah. So, you know, so, and, and I, I, I buy into that theory, which, you know, the overall premise is, is that, you know, we all, um, we, we all become sexually stimulated in different ways. Yeah. Right. And the, the thought is that men are just ready all the time. Like, you know, just, yeah. it's like, we're ready. Like, we're just ready, you know, like, come on yeah. in the room. Like, we're just yeah. ready. But that's not the case. You know, some of us, it's about, you know, contextual, you know, some of us, and this is men and women, right? It's some of it, it's, 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 it's romantic, you know, some is you, you need something that to people would call bizarre, you know, going on. Kink. Kink. Yeah. yeah. Some BDSM, you know, yeah, going yeah. on. So, so. That's why I wonder how much of that was about sexual stimulation in that situation 
versus you not being sexually attracted to the person. So I wish we could almost go back and, uh, I, and, I, could be, <laughs> and I could be your sexual surrogate Unfortunately, in, in the room. Yeah, she's got a baby now. Oh, no. She's got a husband. <laughs> so she's, yeah, and you're with someone. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it just, it, 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 was, it made me pivot. But I think you're actually spot on because what I came to learn a couple of years later was that I had this one sort of one dimensional view of what sex was. And then, as I've said on this podcast once before, when I started viewing sex as potentially a different set of languages, yes. and I thought, fuck, I'm speaking English. Maybe she's speaking Spanish. Yes, there you go. And, uh, you know, and I need to learn a new language in order to have um, a, an effective uh, um, sexual conversation everything changed. Absolutely. And it changed for one of my best friends too, because he was having a similar issue with his sex life. And I said, what if you just saw it as like, your girlfriend speaks a different sex language. You're speaking one and you're like, ah, oh, I'm unsatisfied because she's speaking Spanish and she's going, ah, oh, I'm unsatisfied. She wants touch. She wants the, the 30 minute non-penetrative buildup. Yes. You want to tie her up. <laughs> you want to gag it, get, gag get, her and whip get, it and all that kind of kinky stuff. BDSM stuff. Right. You need to talk. You need to talk. And, and another and language. Another language. And then also too, because you, you drop penetration in there. Yeah. This is something that most men, I mean, yeah, my, men, we need to know this, is that the vast majority, 70 to 80% of women need clitoral stimulation, not just penetrative. Mm -hmm. And I and and see, I mean, this is see, this is this is where um the, the feedback once again. We have no feedback loop, you know, porn. porn. <laughs> that is our teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's our teacher. And what we have to understand is, is no, there are, I love what you're saying. There are different languages, sexual languages. You have to understand how your partner, the language that they speak sex in, and you have to deliver it. And that's also why communication mm -hmm. is the bedrock of all relationships. It really is. Yeah. That's so true. I'm thinking about how I could have fixed that situation. Um, but because I, I, you're right, I totally dismissed it and I didn't do any work. That was the very much characteristic of my younger self, which was if something, and this is relationship, sex, whatever it was, if something isn't perfect now, go, go. <laughs> just run. <laughs> Don't do any work to like, to have the conversation, to, to fix it, to have empathy for someone else might have a, yeah. a different opinion or a different bias or a different attachment style. If it's not perfect, I would dash. Yeah. I'll go in search of perfect, which doesn't exist. Yeah. And, and but this is, I mean, you know, this is all of us. This is this is immaturity. And, yeah, exactly. and that's that's the beauty of learning, you know, as you grow older. On that point of seeking perfection, um, and I asked it a second ago, but we got we went off on the sex thing. Um that sounds weird. <laughs> Please don't clip that. <laughs> um, do we know what we're looking for? Are people good at saying, this is what I want? Hells no. We are terrible. We're all biased when it, when it comes to, to, to love. You know, um, I've done a lot of research around biases. And when it comes to love, it's like we're wearing the foggiest glasses known to, you know, known to, known to human beings. We're terrible when it comes to making any type of rational decision around our love life. You know, normally we are looking for ourselves. Like we literally are, are, are looking for ourselves. It's, it's funny to me um, when you see someone, when, when you ask someone, well, what is your type? Which I hate that phrase, but you'll say, well, 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 what is your type? And typically people will describe someone who's very much like themselves, very much like themselves in so many of these categories. And so we, we are horrendously bad at not only identifying what works well with us, but then making the selection. And on top of that, most women don't make the selection. It's typically the man who makes the selection. And this is where I say that what I like, what I'm seeing now is more women are, are, be, are, are consciously choosing who and what they want in their relationship, opposed to being the ones who are always selected. Why does that happen? Why am why are women not choosing? Is it because yeah, can we because Yeah. I mean it's 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 because of, you know, the craziness of 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 the world and how we've evolved. You know, if you if you think about it was the pill that was one of the first liberation points for women when it came to when it came to dating. 
I mean, and you think about it, that's not that long ago. We're talking about the 60s, we're talking about the 70s, really when the, when the, when the pill became in vogue, you know, if you will, at least in, in the United States. And what that allowed was for women to finally have a little bit of choice when it came to dating. Before that, it was, it was virtually men making the selection, making the choice. You're mine or you're pregnant, so you're definitely mine. And that was it. And then you saw a little bit of liberation come from the pill, which was incredible. But then also what's great now is the dating apps. I know the dating apps get a lot of, a lot of stick for whatever reasons. And yes, we should always hold dating apps accountable. But what's beautiful is that you do have dating apps where you have given women a lot more choice and control in the dating experience, which is important. And even when you look at the studies and you look at the dating app ecosystems that are, that are uh, led by women, they're safer, they're less crude, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Interesting. So are you saying that we contrast is is tends to be better for compatibility than finding someone who's a replication of yourself? Uh, all right, that, that's a good one. So a bit of a, a bit of contrast, right? A, a, a bit of it. It's it's almost like going back to the weak tie theory. Mm. You know, you want someone. I think. Well, let me say this: the the best matches I've seen are based on that blueprint that I outlined from attachment style all the way down to physical attraction. But then context also plays a large role. You know, if I were to place you on a desolate island with someone, I guarantee that person's gonna be the love of your life after yeah, a while. You're gonna have babies. You're gonna have lots of babies. They're gonna be, you know, your soul, you're gonna think they're, they're, they're your soulmate, right? So context plays a large, large, large role, which is why it's interesting to see how politics plays a role in dating. You know, just 20 years ago, politics was insignificant in dating. It was not a topic that was brought up, definitely not brought up on a first date. But, you know, if your partner was on, was, has an opposing political view, it's completely fine. Today, it's one of the top metrics behind whether or not you want to match someone. Is, is politics. There have been some really interesting studies that show that, I mean, me, e, even how sexually obsessed men are, right? We still would turn down, well, it depends on, on who you're talking to, but there's a significant percentage of men, but a vast majority of women who would not have sex with someone that they find physically attractive, but yet have opposing political beliefs. I mean, that, that, but, but that's the context. That's the day and age that we live in. So, so context, I think, plays, plays a role as well. Do we have to work hard to find someone? Because I think there's, there's kind of a prevailing narrative that serendipity will solve it for us. The world has changed tremendously. We don't, have, we don't go to church like we used to. We don't have these pubs or that sort of institutions of community in our lives. So we're like predominantly more lonely than, than ever, living yep. in four white walls in big old cities alone. How, do we have to work hard to find that person? Do we have to put in work? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great question. I, I think we should. I think we should put in the work. I think that we should put effort towards anything that we have interest in. So if a romantic interest is something that you want to have, you, you, you should put the work in. But I don't necessarily think it's about putting the work into someone else. It's about putting the work into you, right? And just elevating you, optimizing you, making you the best you can be, upping your communication, right? Understanding how to build emotional ties, right? Understanding how to make great decisions, understanding how to be a great listener, critical thinker, right? All of these things are going to help you in all aspects of life and definitely in your romantic life. So that's the that's where the hard work needs to go in. But we're in an interesting place because every generation believes their generation had it the hardest when it comes to finding a spouse. This is throughout time. Talk to my grandfather, my grandfather, oh man, you won't believe how hard I had it, you know? And my grandfather had three options, three options. Three options, right? Small village in Jamaica, 
three options, three people. But what I find interesting is there's a, a book, Paradox of Choice by Barry Swartz, and he's the less is more, right? And what's interesting is that we have more options today than say my grandfather had in his day, but it's we have less satisfaction in the choices we make because we believe we have endless choice. That's the real problem that we have. So you think about, you go onto a dating app, right? How many people can you swipe through in a dating app? Endless, it's endless. You, you could literally 10,000 if you want to. And the thought is that you have an option, all 10,000 are option. So because you have 10,000 options and you pick one, there's less value that you have in the one. But if I flipped it around, maybe this is an idea. See, I should pitch you on this idea right now. All right, dating app, <laughs> yeah. this is my pitch. Dating app, but you only get three options a week. Interesting. What do you think? What do you think? Because here, so here's my thought. Uh oh, so so here's my thought. Right, the thought is that you place more value in the option you choose. Right, and that's ultimately, I think, what the challenge is in this day and age. It's about we think, you know, we're we're, we're placing less value because we believe that we have we have endless options. So true. The The issue with the idea is in a world where there are other apps, like if that app existed and it was the only app, then it would be the conversion rate from first date to marriage, I think would be considerably harder and um, higher. However, in a world where I can also use Tinder or Hinge when they're going to give me 10,000 options, I think people will always choose option. So I, I think we'd have a problem getting users yes, yes. because they'd go, well, I'd rather have a thousand guys to choose from or a thousand women to choose from. Um, but, but your point is so spot on that a, a, a lack of options um, means we can, we'll invest more and work harder on the ones we do have to make, to make them work. Whereas if I, if I meet you on a date and I don't feel like it's perfection, I'll go, fuck this. I'll, I've got... 37 men in my Tinder DMs yep. that wanted to meet me as well. So yep. I go try one of them. Yep. And there's always, we're always contending with the false highlight real ex, uh, reality of those 36 other men. Right. Because they looked perfect. They did. They chose their best three selfies. Yep. And they had, he had a Rolex on and he, you know, so, and then you meet him and you go, fuck. He, <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm going to go to the 36 um, others. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And that's a her horrific spiral. Um, another question I had was about honesty okay. from the jump. You go on a first date, you meet someone. How honest should I be? Yeah. Should I tell them about my childhood trauma on the first date? <laughs> like, is that being authentic or, should I, or is, is that offloading? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Chris Rock said it best. You know, when you meet someone, especially on a date, you're not meeting them, you're meeting their representative, <laughs> you know? So... From that standpoint, we have to understand that there is a boundary negotiation that happens, especially on these first dates. And it is the, that, that tennis game again, right? So what you're trying to do ultimately is you're trying to, and let me even back up. Can I say this about the first? One is that I think we, I think most of us do the first date completely wrong, entirely wrong. We set ourselves up from the jump to fail miserably and be disappointed. And the reason why is because it the the first date is too intricate. It's too big. You know, it's dinner, but to prepare for dinner, I'm gonna buy a new whatever, you know, I'm gonna get my hair done, you know, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna buy this new thing, I'm gonna get the car wash, I'm gonna do all this stuff. We've spent, we've invested so much that we've set ourselves up for failure. Also, a first date, quite honestly, over dinner is an interview. It always turns into an interview. And then the culture I've noticed in the UK is, is fascinating is that this is not everyone, but typically I notice is man, we're gonna get completely pissed before the date. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk to each other. So we're just gonna drink, 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 drink. Okay, now let's talk to each other. And so it becomes, it, we set ourselves up for having a very costly date in time, effort, all resources. Instead, it sounds so simple. I like meetups. Let's not, let's even take the pressure off of, of the date situation. Let's call it a meetup. 
30 minutes, let's have coffee, right? The reason why I love that, or a walk, sounds stupid, right? No, a walk for 30 minutes, let's just go walk. At lunch, let's go, go take a walk. The reason why I love that is because the expectation is so much lower in that situation, so much lower. The cost, so much lower, right? So the investment, mm. right, so much lower. So therefore that return on investment, mm. potentially so much higher. But then also psychologically, what I love is, is, is happening is, is if it's coffee, caffeine, if it's a walk, it's in, endorphins going, right? Mm. Those help us to bond, right? Opposed to alcohol, that's a depressant. Right, it's 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 doing it's doing the opposite. So, in terms of elucidating ourselves for great conversation, and preparing ourselves for success, a walk or a coffee is great. The other part of that is I've had mil like not millions. I've had let's say thousands of clients who I've said, okay, tell in particular this is for ladies telling men, tell the guy that you you want to meet him for coffee in the day. A lot of guys are like, I'm not doing that. Yeah, because they want to get laid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're like, I'm not doing that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So right away- It's a good filter. It's a great filter. Yeah. It's an easy filter for you, you know? So that's part of that. And then if it works well, and when I say if it works well is you just need two things on that meetup. Are you physically attracted to them minimally? Mm. And then did they listen to you? So if you have the ability to communicate, they listened critically, you listen critically, and you're physically attracted, that is chemistry. Because we have a hard time defining what is chemistry. You say, what is chemistry? What's the buzz? What, what does that mean? And everyone's like, I don't know, I don't know. It is, I think, one part physical attraction, mutual physical attraction, another part critical listening, listening. If you have that, you have enough to move forward and then see each other in another environment, you know? It's so true. Cause I just reflecting on how many of my friends, both men and women will come back from a date that didn't work out and just resentfully talk about how much they've spent <laughs> and, how, <laughs> and, how, and how much it cost, like how, how long it cost them yes. and, and how much money it cost them and the preparation of the facial and the hair and the oh, nails. And, and they sit there resentfully and it's all, you, you, you're right. Bringing that level of expectation to a to a first encounter, you know, Mo Gaudat sat here and said, "We're happy when our expectations of how life is supposed to be going go are met, and we're unhappy when our expectations of how life is supposed to be going go unmet." I'm coming in with one hell of an expectation that you're going to be my husband. Yes, I've put in all the work, all yes. the investment, the time, three hours, and then if you fall anywhere below that for whatever reason, I'm probably looking for you, you know. Oh God, it's not, you're almost setting yourself up to fail by, by doing such a huge initial upfront investment. Yes, and you know what, you, you were making, I think a, a, a brilliant, brilliant point there is that when you've made that investment, what you end up doing is you're looking for reasons to weed them out. Yeah. Cause you're like, oh man, I did all this. Yeah, and his trainers. <laughs> yeah, what, what trainers is this guy wearing? Oh my God, you see those trainers? Those are last year's yeah, trainers. Yeah. I bought new shoes for this year. And he's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's crazy, 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 crazy. What, yeah. what are you struggling with in your relationship? Oh man, you know, it is time. Really? Time. Quality time? It is, it is, it is, I would say time, but quality time because I am, you know, it, right now I'm predominantly doing television work and, and I've been in TV now, you know, for, uh, since Oprah, you know, mm -hmm. so 12, 13 years. So, so it's, it's, it's been a while. And one thing I've noticed about the television space is that there are moments when you're hot and there are moments when you're not. And when you're hot, it's that's the time to leverage. And so you, you have to, you're already working your ass off, but you better work it off even, even more. And so I'm in that zone right now. I mean, I'm blessed. I'm co-hosting two shows. I'm contributing to three shows, one in the States, two here in the UK. So it's one of these where I'm constantly work every day, every day and work, every day and working. So that time with my wife, that time with my children, that's the time that I wish I can get some back. How are you negotiating that? How are you serving the ball over the net in terms of the tennis analogy to make sure things aren't, you know, 
she still feels like a priority and your family still feel like a priority. Yeah, that, that's a great one. I mean, finding those moments and making sure that we're, in t or should I say, making sure that we're intentional about the moments that we do have, right? So this morning, for example, before I came over here, we had breakfast together, went out, had breakfast together, sat, talked with the dog, right? Those moments are immeasurable, right? Those moments, right? To have those moments together. Um, I dropped my boys off at school, right? Walk, you walk them 10 minutes to school, 10 minutes the other to the, to the bus. Those moments, immeasurable, you know, when I was, you know, getting, helping them dress, tying their ties, those moments and making sure that I'm fully in those moments, not I'm in that moment, but I'm on my phone at the same time. I'm in that moment. Oh, I've got to post this on Instagram. No, phone goes away right? Phone goes away. And so making sure that the moments that we have, that I'm fully, I'm fully in them. And then also I think gratitude is something that is, is very important. And I've, I've been practicing this for, I don't know, six, seven years, but being appreciative of those moments and then reflecting upon those, you know, so every morning, the first thing I do in the morning is I, I consciously think about the moments yesterday that I'm appreciative of. And what I find myself doing is I'm rarely thinking about, oh, I'm so happy this happened at work, or I'm so happy about the ratings of this. It's always, man, I'm so happy that my son who's 11 held my hand walking to the bus. He's 11, but he still held my hand. You know, I'm so happy that my son came over and he asked me to tie his tie. He gave me a kiss on the cheek and said, thank you, dad. Like, those are the moments that really get to me. And that's what I, I wake up thinking about. And I'm able to think about it because I was in the moment fully. And what's, talk to me about the near term then. What are you working on in the near term? I know you've got, we don't even talk about it today, but you've got multiple revenue streams all over the place. You're an entrepreneur. You've got two, t two or three TV shows that you're working on simultaneously, which yep. is absurd. Yes. All of these things going on in your life. What am I, what, give me a picture of your full, your professional portfolio per se. Okay, so so there there are a lot of things happening, uh, and they're all in different categories. So so on the television side, I am uh, I'm co-hosting Married at First Sight UK, and I'm also co-hosting Celebs Go Dating. We're in our eleventh series of Celebs Go Dating, and our wow. seventh uh, of uh, of Married at First Sight. So 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 those are those are big entities. I contribute to the Lorraine show. Oh yeah. And also to Steph's Pack Lunch yep. here. And then in the United States, I'm a contributor to Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. Right. So that by itself are those are a couple full times, right? But that's that's kind of like the, the TV side. Do you have a podcast? I don't. Mm. I I did like a years ago I, I did, but I mean, quite honestly, looking at this and it, you know, you are, and, and and this is me not trying to trying to gas you up. Is that you are incredibly inspiring, incredibly inspiring, and I, I, and you know what's interesting is I, I I I look at you and I think, okay, God, this guy's younger than me. You know, how is this? He's he's so much younger than me, and he's inspiring me, right? And what it is is that you pursue excellence to a degree I don't know if I've ever witnessed. I'm talking about, I've worked with some of the top billionaires in the world I've interviewed. I was a business columnist for USA Today and I interviewed some of the most successful entrepreneurs, like period. And your level of pursuit of excellence surpasses them. Where's my billion? Yeah. <laughs> but, but see, it's not about the, it's not, no, but it's not about that, yeah. you know? You're, and, 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 and so, all I say is that, so you are incredibly inspiring to me and to, to, to many people. And to the question around the podcast is part of that inspiration is, is man, like, this is a great space, you know, to, to get into. So that's something that is in the back of my mind, but I'm not actively pursuing it. That's very kind. It makes me feel really uncomfortable. That's why I cracked that billion yeah. joke. I didn't know what to do with my face the whole time I was like, how do you do feel? Do how do you feel? Yeah, it's, a, it's a huge, it's a huge compliment. And I, I, I received the compliment and I, I, I believe what you're saying. It just, you know, it makes you feel uncomfortable because I, you know, I don't know why it just makes me feel uncomfortable when I, when I, I really appreciate it. And I believe every word you said, um, I believe you meant every word you said. Um, and I know that we are, I think the reason why 
our team will be successful in pretty much anything we do is because of what you said. Mm -hmm. So it's because I think we care more about the small stuff. Yes. And that's where for me, excellence begins. We can all make the big decisions to start a podcast is a big decision. It doesn't guarantee success. No. It's all the tiny things that people that are easy to do, but also easy not to do that end up defining your trajectory. And over the last, I think two years in particular, actually because of this podcast and actually because it's so data centric and I look at lines and charts and how one decision that like the team and I make or that Jack makes can just tilt the direction of the line. Right. And I go, and it's been this reinforcer to me that in fact, the, the most important things and, and the biggest opportunity is the smallest things everyone else, nobody, nobody else cares about. Yes. They'll be thinking about, let's get a bigger guest or like, you know, let's get, you know, the big stuff, but it's the small stuff where we have our opportunity. Yes. Um, so you've identified something that I hold very true and I consider it to be, but be my professional religion. Um, and I appreciate the compliment. You, it means you, a lot. No, no, d definitely. And, and, and you just, I think, destroyed a myth that exists as well. And that is that we should be sweating the small stuff. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you know, the whole, oh, mm. don't sweat. No, sweat the small stuff mm. because that's where greatest change comes. Mm. The same thing with your romantic relationships. People are like, ah, don't sweat the small stuff. No, mm. that one missed hug, you know, that mm. one missed I love you. Let's correct it now. Correct it now. Yeah. So, so, so powerful. I, we have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question for the next guest. They don't know who they're leaving it for. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of a through line, all the guests having a conversation with each other. Um, and I don't get to read the question until I open the book. Um, <laughs> when was the last time you cried of happiness? Oh my gosh. Cried of happiness. Oh my gosh. I know. I mean, I've cried tears of sadness recently. Um, You've cried tears of sadness recently? Yeah, man. I mean, my, uh, my sister-in-law passed away two weeks ago. And my, I've, I've had, I mean, I've had a string of passings in my family that is just devastating, devastating. First funeral, I had to plan, you know, my wife and I planned uh, just, I mean, just, yeah, one of those. So, so, uh, you know, I, I think, I think of tears of sadness. What did that teach you about life? Oh, this someone young and it's short it goes like this. I've, I've, uh, I've been at two deathbeds, one of someone what I, who I would call incredibly young and another one, someone who's lived a full life, they both said the same thing and it haunts me. They both said, this thing goes by quick. Life goes by quick. That's all we get. And it gives me chills because I think about them looking at me and that's part of why I think I have lived the life or live life the way I live it and why I focus so much in the moment and why I try to express how I feel about people in the moment, because we may never get the moment again, you know? Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's taught me a lot. I mean, to write a eulogy, to have to write a eulogy, you know, for someone so young, it, it, it did, I will say some practical things though it taught me. It, it, it taught me, we all need wills. We all need a will. I think that we all should be consciously aware of how we want to be laid to rest. It's a major debate that happens in the family and you know to have that consciously thought out so that we so that people can your loved ones can honor you in the way that you want to be honored, I think is incredibly important. Um, so to have a will and to have pre-thought some of this it's, it's not morbid. I think we have to understand this is part of our humanity is that we will not be here, you know, forever. So those are thoughts that are practical thoughts that I've taken. And now I have a will. Now I've written, you know, how, where I want to be buried, how I want to be buried. These are incredibly important. Um, I cried like, I cried for, it could be 30, 40 minutes straight at my wedding. <laughs> I, I, I just cried. I cried the entire wedding. 
I just cried and cried and cried and cried. All the pictures of me cry, cry. cry. <laughs> so uh, th those are those are probably that's the last tears of tears of happiness. But I'm I'm incredibly happy. But more than that, I'm appreciative. You know, I'm appreciative of life, and it's actually the tears of sadness that's allowed me to be appreciative. Well, Paul, thank you. Um, my team met you a couple of weeks ago and they are obsessed with you. <laughs> and it's and it's funny because it's not necessarily, it's because of who you were as a person to all of them, how you treated them, how wonderful you are, how, you know, it's all the small stuff. It's kind of the stuff you said at the start about that underdog and reaching out to the person that might be stood up against the wall. It's all of that stuff where everyone in this building, I wasn't here, I think I was out of the country, if I remember correctly, but when you came to this building, they were just, you converted them into raving fans. <laughs> and I don't know how long you were here or how much you paid them. But, <laughs> I paid them a lot. Well, yeah. Okay, that explains <laughs> it. They were just all absolute super fans sure. of yours. And your whole philosophy, you said something you said something to someone, I'm not entirely sure who it was, you know, cause we'd ask, we'd essentially ask you to come and help us with something with a project we're working on, which I'm very excited about. Um, and you said something almost about like karma where you were, you do, you do things for people because you kind of believe in planting that seed. Like yes. you don't know when it will, yes. it will flourish or when it will, you know, come to fruition, but you just do good with the belief that like karma. Yes. And such an important way to live. And you actually helped me to realize that because the impact you had on all these people here, you turned all of them into disciples. And they're like fairly influential people that, that, you know, they're well connected. We've got a lot of interesting people coming here, you know, several days a week. Amazing. And then today, having had a chance to sit with you and ask you some questions that really a lot of the questions I asked for my own selfish <laughs> pursuit of trying to figure shit out, you've, you've, you've changed a lot in me and you're, you're going to change a lot in my relationships. I'm partly sat here, you know, winding this podcast up so I can go fix some shit. Okay. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I think a lot of people that have listened to this conversation will be feeling the same way. Tremendous value, tremendously kind man. Um, even when the cameras are off, you're just a class, class act. Um, and I've no doubt that you're going to get everything you deserve. That we talked about that sort of like long tail lagging in value. Yes. You're going to, it's going to be, your future is going to be immense. Yeah. I, so. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. I'm appreciative. I love you. Mm. I love your team, right? I really do. Uh, and um, it's an honor to, to be here. So thank you so much for having me. I and all of my team love you too. I can speak on behalf of all of them. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Quick one. We have a brand new sponsor on this podcast, which I'm very excited to tell you about. They're a brand called Blue Jeans by Verizon, and they are a video conferencing and collaboration tool that has changed the game for our team. As someone who's on calls pretty much 80% of the day building my businesses and speaking to my teams all over the world. It's the guaranteed security that differentiates blue jeans from all of the other options that are out there in terms of video conferencing. Their enterprise grade security means you can protect your organization from malicious attacks and establish real trust with everyone that joins your meeting. And that is something. There are so many things that make sense and, and make blue jeans um, a better option than the sort of competitors out there. And I'll be talking about all of those aspects, those features, and the reasons why I use Blue Jeans in the coming episodes. If you want to check it out, you can head to www.bluejeans.com to learn more.